EMDR is just another way to get at the root of my trauma. You spent your media time looking up EMDR? Yep. Like to know what I'm getting into. In that case, tell me what it is in under 30 seconds. I'll let you get your swim on. Uh, looking up EMDR is great. Knowledge is power. Be informed. Ask questions. Ready? Mm-hmm. Go. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. The lights forced by lateral sensory output, allowing you to make connections about your traumas and desensitize you to them. <sighs> so close. You forgot. It helps to illuminate the capital T trauma in your life. I don't have any capital T trauma. I found out awful news about how I was born and my mother couldn't deal. I have been through way worse. So EMDR, or Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. She was so much better at pronouncing that and getting it right than I am. The first time I watched Grey's Anatomy was doing a video like a, a couple of years ago on this channel and it, it was rubbish. <laughs> Several people have said, no, take another pun. Okay, I will listen. I've Googled an episode that seems to be related to mental health or about a particular type of trauma therapy called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing or EMDR. Good luck, everyone. Some of the world's top trauma specialists have proven that our brains may forget the traumas we survive, but our bodies, especially our nervous systems, always keep score. Do we forget the trauma? I don't agree. I'm not one of these psychiatrists that bows at the feet of everything that Freud said, but I do believe in the conscious and the unconscious mind. While consciously, we might repress these memories into the unconscious so we're no longer aware of them, they're still there in the mind, playing out in different ways, mentally and physically. While I understand what they're trying to get at here, and it's probably the same point they're trying to get at, it's a very pop psychology and frankly inaccurate way of explaining it. BP's dropping. Can you mobilize the liver better? It's the IVC. Clamp? What? No, I need a clamp. Maybe you should have thought of that before skipping out on community service. We've got it. But I... Let's get two units of blood. I'm on it. We need distal and proximal control. Clamp. Mom? I don't feel good. Me either, Sozo. Dreams and nightmares can be a symptom of re-experiencing in the context of post-traumatic stress disorder, along with hypervigilance and uh, avoidant behaviours of anything that reminds you of that trauma. Though it's also important to remember that nightmares are not in and of themselves pathological. They can be proportionate, though distressing responses to difficulties going on in our life that's part of being human. Memories are stored in our shoulders, spines, stomach or hands. Well, they're not. They're absolutely not. It's nonsense. Without us ever knowing. It was one of the worst fires I've ever seen. Smoke was so thick and the roof it wouldn't hold. It was... <sighs> Is that your way of telling me I'm taking Doc to school today? The memories are stored in our mind. They can then affect our body because the mind and the body are connected to each other. They are one. It's all part of the same human. And while it might not consciously be noticeable, that's where we start linking psychological distress and things like skin disorders, irritable bowel syndrome, migraines. Tom, I need CT for my daughter. What's wrong? She's been vomiting and she has a headache. Well, it sounds like the flu. She also has a VP shunt for spina bifida. So I need you to get her in right away, please. Okay. Hey, Zola. Not feeling well? A ventriculoperitoneal shunt drains excessive cerebrospinal fluid from around the brain and around the spine into the sort of the chest cavity and the abdominal cavity so that it can be flushed out and drained away. It tries to maintain a constant pressure within the central nervous system because if the pressure builds up, squishing our brain and our spinal cord, you're going to have a bad time. Headache and vomiting are signs of raised intracranial pressure, probably a blocked shunt that needs replacing. I read that hyperbaric chambers were invented before oxygen was even discovered. A British doctor in 1662 used organ bellows to hand pump air into an enclosed space. So cool, right? I mean, terrible that our patient needs it, but since she does, so cool. Medicine can be fascinating as well as devastating at the same time. Hyperbaric chambers are not found in every hospital. In fact, I think... Most places that medically need to use a hyperbaric chamber have to reach out to local sort of scuba diving centers that have these chambers to treat people with the bends or decompression sickness. What happens is you move too quickly from an area of high pressure to low pressure. At high pressure, all of that excess pressure starts to force more gases to be dissolved into your blood. When you move to a lower pressure, when that comes down, it starts to bubble out. Bubbling in your blood, 
not a good thing. You then go into a hyperbaric chamber that tries to recompress things and then gradually decompress at a much, much slower rate so your body can adjust. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Hoping a 90 minute dive in the chamber can revive her, although it might take longer. I know her. Karev, you in or out? In. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin, the protein in blood that carries oxygen. It binds much more strongly to the same spot on hemoglobin that oxygen does. So even if you then put an oxygen saturation probe on your finger, somebody with carbon monoxide poisoning looks like their oxygen sats are really good because all of those spaces are taken up. And they're taken up by carbon monoxide, not oxygen. So your tissues are still being deprived of oxygen called hypoxia. Going in the increased environmental pressure of a high hyperbaric chamber is hopefully going to force more oxygen to dissolve into the blood which is then going to help more oxygen bind to hemoglobin and displace that carbon monoxide and treat the carbon monoxide poisoning. That's the principle at least. You mean to tell me you locked yourself in here with your therapist and you didn't think that was against oh I don't know all the rules? Technically she was just one of my therapists when I was in residential treatment. How many did you have? Three different therapists, different modalities, kind of like when a trauma comes in and we need to figure out how many surgeons we need to send in from how many different angles. Except in your brain. Yeah, pretty much. Treating your therapist in hospital? Not the one. Boundaries, please. It's like she's trying to rescue the therapist like they rescued you, only with sort of slightly more clouded objectivity here because of the nature of that relationship. I think three therapists is too many therapists. Therapy is a marathon, not a sprint. If you can be over-medicated, you can also be over therapized. Is that a word? I'm running with it. Yeah, no, she would just, she would just kill me because I forgot everything that she taught me about how to just, you know, calm my nervous system. So if she woke up, she'd be so pissed at me right now. The therapist isn't contained because they're here with what's thought to be carbon monoxide poisoning that might be self-inflicted. And because they're not contained and they were the one containing you, you're no longer contained. And if this can happen to them, it can happen to me. And then your mind starts running away with you, magnifying the issue, catastrophizing, and you just regress. It happens, not necessarily like this in the middle of a hyperbaric chamber, <laughs> but a wobble will happen. You've got to remember those skills you've learned and now is the big test because you've got to apply them at a time when it's not easy to apply them. I'm guessing the two of you were close. I can't stand her, she was the worst. Hating your therapist is not uncommon. It tends to manifest as something called a transference reaction, where the thoughts and the emotional states from a previous relationship get transferred onto a new one that reminds you of that. The therapist then takes on the role of the overcritical or the rejecting parent. And when they challenge you, then they elicit the same emotional states that your parents did when they pushed back. It's normal, it's common, it's something to be worked through in the sessions. Let me guess. You're pissed I'm taking away your pool time. I already had Michelle for therapy today. Three hours of group and it's fruit punch day, which is the worst. And now I'm, I'm what? I'm supposed to stare at a light bar and all my troubles are going to disappear. That's so much therapy. Words can hurt and words can heal. Therapy needs to be treated with the same respect as medication. There is such a thing as too much therapy. There is such a thing as the wrong type of therapy or therapy done in the wrong way. There's, I see so many cases where therapists are prematurely pushing people into doing very trauma focused work without really a full appreciation of how destabilizing that can be for people that don't really have the emotional coping skills to manage the consequences of what happens when you open up Pandora's traumatic box. You need to take it one step at a time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. EMDR is just another way to get at the root of my trauma. You spent your media time looking up EMDR. Yep. Like to know what I'm getting into. In that case, tell me what it is in under 30 seconds. I'll let you get your swim on. Uh, looking up EMDR is great. Knowledge is power. Be informed. Ask questions. Ready? Mm-hmm. Go. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. The light's forced by lateral sensory output, allowing you to make connections about your traumas and desensitize you to them. <sighs> so close. You forgot it helps to illuminate the capital T trauma in your life. I don't have any capital T trauma. I found out awful news about how I was born and my mother couldn't deal. I have been through way worse. So EMDR or eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. She was so much better at pronouncing that and getting it right than I am. It's based on the premise that you process most of your memories during rapid eye movement sleep, where all your muscles 
bar those involved in breathing and your eye movements are paralyzed. It's also based on the premise that our memories are not the most reliable, particularly those emotionally laden memories. So if I'm feeling really angry, I'm going to be more readily able to recall memories of times I was angry than times I was happy. We add more weight to those memories. So then when we start thinking about things and ruminate on them, we actually start distorting them into something that they weren't. And we reconsolidate those memories, perhaps as more emotionally biased than what truly happens. EMDR then tries to recreate the eye movements that happen during REM sleep while going through the, the, the trauma itself to try and reconsolidate these memories in a more objective and less emotionally biased way. That's the theory. I'm skeptical if it really does work in that way, but it works. And then again, we don't really know how paracetamol works. Sometimes it's enough to know that it works and that done in the right way, it helps us tolerate trauma, doesn't eliminate it. You know, if you're gonna eat in front of me, could you at least share? No. Because? Because boundaries. I don't share food. The eating in front of her is getting on my wick as well. Her body language is actually saying that she's not taking this seriously, yet she's expecting the patient to take it seriously. I never spent long enough in foster homes to remember the wallpaper, let alone the people. I had a husband who beat me, but he's dead now, so. So no trauma. So what defenses are we seeing here? Some denial, some minimization. Also, who gets to decide if an event is traumatic or not? Is that for the therapist or the professional to decide? Or is that for the two of you to work through objectively and then for the patient to decide whether that was traumatic to them and should be processed and treated as a trauma or not? Get out of here. Dr. Karev, you know. I know, I know, but if the one person who could help me feel okay could just go off one day and try and kill themselves, then what does that say about me? Huh? Because it's, it's all about hope, and that hope has been put in jeopardy now for her long-term recovery if the person that was helping her recover has not been able to recover. Hope is motivating. It gives you something to aim for, but it can also be provocative as it now gives you something to lose. Par example. Raise the arm of the patient, count down to the fourth intercostal space, prep and drape in sterile fashion. Okay, why are you listing the steps for a chest tube insertion if it's not indicated? Eject with lidocaine, make an incision above the verb. Uh, Kelly Clamp. Joe, what's going on? This is supposed to help me. She's the one who taught me this. Feet on the ground. List the things you know by heart. It's supposed to trick your nervous system into thinking that you're safe, but it's not working. It's not working. Okay, well, how can I help you? Wait, what do you I, mean? I need to think of something else. I need to think of something else. I'm pregnant. This is really good. Reciting the procedure for inserting a chest drain is being used here as a grounding technique to try and break the cycle of anxiety spiraling into a panic attack. Grounding techniques are designed to take your attention away from what's going on in here to something tangible, something you can see, something you can hear, feeling the ground under your feet, paying attention to your breaths. I think this is a great example. I might be happy, but out of my mind, terrified. And terrified, it's a therapy thing. You listed all these positive feelings and then you said but as if being terrified erased everything that you said prior, but the happy, the terror, it's all true. Well, I don't like it. You can have multiple feelings at once and often the physiological response that we identify with to anxiety, to excitement, to fear is, is all the same. Which one we identify it as depends on our emotional state at the time. If we're feeling safe, we might label those same perceptions as uh, excitement, whereas if we feel unsafe, we'll label those very same experiences as fear. If you could move through that fear and that shame and let yourself feel angry. I can't. Which means I'll be stuck here forever. Therapy isn't about having your problems solved. It's about gaining clarity on your thoughts and your feelings and learning to tolerate those and manage them and put them into context. Sit with them without impulsively reacting to them or trying to dull them or take those feelings and push them on someone else so that they can deal with them for us. Okay, are you happy? Good morning, Carly. Do you have a few minutes to talk? Ten sessions with you and that dumbass light bar. Not really fair to take it out on the light bar, but okay. I hate everything. There's the anger. My mom, my rapist dad, Paul, the fact that I'm here staring at the same image of my mom pulling away from me in a diner over and over and over again and never moving past it. Never moving past it. She is moving past it. She's facing it. She's feeling the anger. She's coming to someone to talk about it. 
This is progress. Therapy is, 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 is not about feeling better. In fact, therapy often can make you feel worse before you feel better. What is it the therapist said in Ted Lasso? The truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Are we both consenting adults? Yep. Are we okay if we agree to throw things at walls? Not people, just the walls. Yep, right there. That's what makes you not Paul. Because you can feel anger while controlling your behavior. See, it's about tolerating emotions. Sitting with the anger, not just reacting to it, and certainly not about dulling it or avoiding it. Emotions are human, and contrary to the popular belief amongst doctors, feeling emotions doesn't cloud your objectivity. It's not the feelings that do that. It's our lack of awareness about what those feelings are, how they affect us, and how they're playing out in a particular dynamic in that room in that time. That's the bit that can cloud your objectivity, and also that's the bit that we can have some control over. We can get better at learning to regulate our emotions, recognize them, understand them, manage them, even if we can't necessarily change what we feel. I can't be your doctor anymore. I never should have been in the first place. So Dr. Bailey, we'll take good care of you. What? Boundaries. Looks like somebody learned something after all. Eventually, he still went in the chamber with her. There was a bit of rubbish, inaccurate pop psychology stuff right at the very start. But actually, there was some very good stuff in this one. I like the therapy journey, even if some of the specifics about how it actually played out in the room were a bit meh. And the grounding technique. I really like the grounding technique. Let me know what you thought, though, in the comments below. Shall I look at more Grey's Anatomy? You're going to have to point me in the right direction of what episodes to watch, because there's so many and I've never watched it before. Let me know in the comments and I'll see you soon for another video. Love you, bye.